It's another week and it's another opportunity to join us on Liquid Gold TV brought to you by Brayburn Whiskey. I'm Bryony Perdue and this week we're going to focus in on whiskies to watch. So fill your glass with something special and come and join me for a dram. This evening we are joined by Billy Abbott who is a writer, he's a presenter, educator and he also happens to be an ambassador for the Whiskey Exchange which if you like whiskey might just be a whiskey person, a whiskey lover's dream job. So Billy thank you so so much for joining us. That's fine, thank you very much for having me. Now um, at Brayburn um, one of the things, well the main thing that Brayburn is really passionate about is investment grade whiskey so that you get a product that you can get a cask of and that's going to appreciate over time and with the aim of each client keeping that for a number of years so that it gets to its sort of full potential both flavour and um, appreciation wise. Uh, what is your experience with whiskey as an alternative investment? I do have a large whiskey collection, I do buy and sell whiskey at auction uh, on occasion and yes the things I bought just to drink seem to have gone up really rather well which has sort of like informed a lot of my decisions these days when I talk to people about investment and uh, I've gradually sort of taken some advice from my boss over time the key advice we've always had is buy nice whiskey because if you buy nice whiskey people are going to want it um, when it comes to casks uh, I, again I, uh, I've had done a little bit of dabbling but only with smaller casks I, I've, I owned one which was bottled for me by a friend of mine and I've got another cask that went hidden away in a warehouse somewhere but generally for myself I've not invested in whiskey because my sort of approach to whiskey on a day-to-day -day basis is much more sort of fleeting it's a sharing whiskeys for trying bottles and things like that but I've worked with independent bottlers and I've worked with brokers people like that I've spoken to these people over the last decade and sort of seen that other side of the business and it's something which it's one of the reasons I quite like Brayburn is because the approach you have is this whole thing of treating whiskey as an investment item for my finance days and things like that is that understanding of rather than people saying i'll buy one and save one in the cupboard for later it's a case of looking at it as a way of investing and you know hopefully making money over time rather than being just a i'm going to share it with my mates which is one of the standard sort of ways people seem to look at investment of whiskey so yeah but yeah, so whatever you do when it comes to individual bottles don't follow my advice but generally i'm quite good uh, with an eye to emerging players on the market and emerging distilleries that are trying to sort of get that kind of reputation, do, do you see any newly founded distilleries that are kind of making their way towards that kind of reputation? It's, it's a strange one because there's so many new distilleries emerging and I was thinking about the, you know, how, what I want to talk about today. I realise there's so few of them in Scotland, so it's outside of Scotland looking at them. and. The Macallans, the Downwalls, the Highland Parks. Highland Park is a sort of more recent sort of thing. And that, when it comes to casks, definitely I can see Highland Park. Macallan and Downwall have the halo around them from their individual bottles, from the, the cachet those things have. And so it's looking at the distilleries, trying to work out which distilleries at the moment start to build up that name recognition. There's a few of them out there, but most of the newer distilleries are still very new. The, the, the current burst of new distilleries is still only a few years old. There's, you know, every now and again little chunks of distilleries turning up. Um, early on in a distillery's life, it's, it can often be the, the make or the break can be that you get a very valuable investment from someone who goes, I see potential in this, and they put enough money into it to go, do you know what, this actually has become from a dream to become reality. Have you seen any particular distilleries that you, you've watched that happen with over the last few years? The investment thing's weird because there's a lot of smaller distilleries start from absolutely nothing or you know come from wells so they can actually get investment either from the finance world or from the whiskey world themselves. But there's one which show which popped up recently and it's um I was quite surprised by it because it was a company that ended up being bought out and it's Strathern um, in Scotland. And uh, Tony Reeman Clark, I think is who uh, who started it, uh, is a former brewer. He built the distillery pretty much himself from scratch. It's a tiny place and it, it was really just this tiny little distillery. And then Douglas Lang came in with a big chunk of cash and all of a sudden, you know, they have the ability to do more things, actually expand what they're doing and do that. And a lot of times when a large company comes into a smaller company like that, you know, you're, the small company will say, uh, oh, no, nothing's going to change. I'll just keep on doing what we're always doing. And my favorite companies, the companies I always look at you know, as, as honest, but also the ones who are more interesting are the ones who say, oh, things are going to change. What's the point in getting the investment if we're not going to change, you know? 
And so um, there's a big investment company out there. The one which I always want with this sort of distillery, I always look out for things that Distill Ventures are doing. Uh, Distill Ventures is uh, an investment company. You know, they go out and they find drinks companies and invest in them. And so it's generally what I try and do is uh, for, it doesn't happen that often, you know, generally people will build slowly and there is that whole thing of, it's the slow growth, bringing in sort of like money as you need to. In the whiskey world, it's hard because you have to sit on your stock for so long. It's just the reason why you see so many gin companies alongside a gin, uh, whiskey company. But something like Distill Ventures, just have a keep an eye on what they're doing. You can see these companies which they're getting these injections of cash because Distill Ventures believe in them. They're experts. They know what they're talking about. Uh, but also they have almost this self-fulfilling prophecy that when they put the money in, they also have the expertise to help grow those businesses as well. Um you've you've been very uh, generous with sort of uh, mentioning a few areas and uh, general regions that you like in not necessarily just scotland but in england as well that are producing great whiskies but at braeburn honestly just celebrating whiskey is what they do that's what they love and don't feel shy to mention specific uh, distilleries and places if you want to that you really like it's not a favoritism com competition on here it's just about like people that watch this show we hope are interested in just learning as much as, as seeing what's going on in the whiskey world. So are there any particular uh, distilleries that we've not necessarily touched on yet that you think I wanted to watch? Um, if you've ever been up to uh, sort of North Glen Warrangy, up to Dornoch, it's just on the other side of the Dornoch Firth, there's a golf course there, uh, but also there's a hotel, the Dornoch Castle Hotel. And if you like whiskey, and especially if you like old and rare whiskey, you have to visit. It's an absolutely incredible hotel. I'm not just saying that because I know the guys run it. I've stayed there before I knew them and I really liked it. The food and drink is great, but they have an incredible whiskey bar. But also the brothers who run it have opened a distillery. It started off in an old fire station out the back of the hotel and it's now moved on. They've got a new site elsewhere in the village, but they are, and this is, the, they're making very distinctive spirits. Really, really different to anything else because um, they're using interesting yeasts, they're using very, very long ferments, they're using really tiny stills, really tiny uh, washbacks. Um, a lot of it due to space constraints of they're in a tiny fire station. Um, but no, the Simon who looks after the sort of the techie side of the distilling is a yeast master. And he just has this little lab and he just grows yeasts from things, you know, and just uses those to ferment out their wash and then says, oh, let's see what flavours this makes today then. And so there's incredible array of casts and I think they're, they're settling down a little bit now to come down with certain lines they're going to be doing but their initial business plan was just to sell casts to whiskey connoisseurs and people they knew and so they just sold out all of their casts from folks who knew what they knew about whiskey and knew how good they were um, and they've got like a members club and all that sort of thing but now they're laying down casts they've got production every single day um, and I've not seen anybody doing anything like it ever because they're really looking back to the old processes and seeing what people used to do, trying to recreate it, but with a bit of a nod to the modern as well. If you see their stills, they don't necessarily look like the stills you'll see back in the old days. Things are developing and moving all the time in whiskey and in every possible industry. Things are always moving forward and looking forward. Um, with someone as knowledgeable about the world of spirits as you, it would be remiss of me not to ask what you can see for particular distillers, flavours, countries, brands that you see coming up in the next few years that you're very excited about. So what distillers of whiskey do you see being exciting over the next few years? Well, it's the guys really I've been speaking about so far, you know, they, these little distillers, these new guys. There's a couple that I really want to know what they're doing. Um, there's a couple which I, you hear these rumours through the grapevine, you know, uh, over in the USA, uh, Westland, over in uh, Seattle. Their whiskies are incredible. Their master distiller, uh, Matt Hoffman, is one of the best distillers in the world. He's creating great things, you know. Uh, back over here, the English Whiskey Company, uh, David Fitt, who uh, looks after them. They're the first new English distillery for like 100 years. And they're because they're the old the old guys, they're, yeah, well, they're 15 years old now. Yeah, they're, they're not that old. Uh, but still, David is producing incredible things. If you get a chance to pop into the distillery sometime, look into the... Uh, uh, fermentation vessels look into the washback see what he's making I, I was sworn to secrecy when i was there it's like are you doing this he's like yes but don't tell people 
you know, it's loads and loads of things. I can, I can tell you all about the show too and the, and the bio gel that I really want to look at as well, but that, that's entirely outside of the scope of this. So the, the whiskey world is huge. The spirits world is even bigger and everybody's learning from each other and bringing those ideas together. And seeing those combinations is the thing I'm really intrigued about at the moment. Well, I think that actually that is just the, the perfect sort of it encapsulates what um, at Braeburn we want to be able to highlight is the fact that there is constant evolution in the whisky world. There is constant development in which which distilleries to keep an eye on, and we've seen over the last few years particularly a massive spike in how useful it can be to invest in whisky and to invest in the idea of whisky as well as the fact that it has financial return. It's very um, it's a very romantic thing, poetic thing to get involved in, as well as it having significant financial benefits. So it's been an absolute pleasure, Billy Abbott, to speak to you from the Whiskey Exchange about your seemingly endless expertise in the world of whiskey and spirits. Thank you so much for joining us here on Liquid Gold TV. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you, thank you. Take care. <laughs> Each week we have the pleasure of being joined by a Braeburn client and this week is no exception but we are joined by a couple of Braeburn clients who are, let's say, high flyers. Uh, we also have Sam Gordon from Braeburn and we're going to ask a few questions of these fab Braeburn clients. Hello gentlemen, we've got Gareth, Rubin and Sam. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. Uh, how are you all doing? How's it going? Good. Very good. Yeah. So tell, tell us a little bit about you two. Uh, t tell us where you're based. Tell us uh, how you got into whiskey. Tell us tell us a little bit about you. You want to start? Yes, uh, me and my, uh, Gareth and myself both stay in, uh, in Hong Kong. Um, I actually preferred the Irish whiskeys and Gareth was more of a Scotch drinker. And Proper whiskey. He, rough the, well, yeah. And then, you get a uh, head shake from Sam there. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Gareth actually got me introduced to the um, the Scotch, uh, Scottish whiskey, and with the investment. So, yeah, all uh, thanks to Gareth. Uh, I've known Ruben for close on four years now. Four years, yeah. Uh, uh, along along with the other guys that uh, are also based in Hong Kong and also clients of Braeburn. Um, there's probably about five of us now, um, and we've we've all been working together for. About four or five years now. Yeah. You guys obviously have a number of friends and colleagues that also invest in whiskey. What was it that started you off in investing in casks of whiskey? I think I'm to blame for this one. Yeah, this is all Gareth's fault. Yeah. Um, I I think my original idea when, when this all started was to get a cask um, somewhere <coughs> around this point in my lifetime. Keep it for roughly 20 years and then sell, uh, not sell it, but rather bottle it just before my, my 50th birthday, just to have like a, a special momentum for my, my 50th birthday. Um, and I started looking around and I found, I found various companies, uh, but Braeburn particularly stuck out to me as a very professional um, company as Sam got hold of me. And he presented a few casks to me and I said, you know, it sounds like a nice idea my 50 year momentum but as an investment it actually sounds even better um now uh, sam why did you advise the particular the, why did you advise gareth rubin and the, the sort of collective of investors there in hong kong to go for the casks that they've gone for well they started together so the first investment they all made was ben uh, gareth and rubin so i advised them on a Kalila. For me, Kalila is the perfect island malt. It's not in your face or big. It's not, you know, a very, very heavily peated spirit. It's quite light. Um, it's a very pale malt. Um, and it's something that's growing in demand across the globe. You know, you'll see it across in the shelves in Hong Kong. You'll see it in the airports. You'll see it, you know, in bars now across the countries. Um, so that surge in demand for Kalila is something that I look for. But it's also got a really low production output. So Kalila typically caters towards blends. So Diageo blends, Johnny Walkers. For them to invest into a cask from that distillery is something very exclusive. You know, they don't actually produce a lot of single malt. So that adds value. Over time, the spirit becomes valuable. 
And since that cask, Gareth's invested on his own. Uh, I don't think Ruben has quite yet, but also Ben has invested into some casks by himself as well. Um, but that first cask was purely based off the fact it's such a, a remarkable brand, Kalina. The idea of I think, investing in casks, Gareth, you mentioned that you'd actually sort of known about it for a while and it was a plan of yours to invest. Um, why, why casks as opposed to bottles of whiskey? Uh, again, I mean, there's, um, but if I buy a rare bottle of whiskey, um, sure, I can probably make some money on it. Um, anything that, that has a demand supply factor to it is going to make some money in the future. Um, but I can go and buy a 25 year bottle of whiskey. The label says 25 years, even 25 years from now. Where if I buy a cask um, 25 years from now, I've got 25 years uh, added to that whiskey, you know? Um, yeah, from, from the from the outset, it's a, it's a larger capital investment to buy a cask versus a bottle, sure. Um, but you, it affords you the opportunity to buy um, whiskey that's probably uh, a lot younger and not quite um, in demand right now. And therefore you can get quite a cheaper price. But you know, you wait 25 years and instead of having one bottle of 25 year old whiskey, you've got 300 of them. Um, and so it's, it's just got, uh, for, for me, it just maintains a, a much bigger uh, investment potential in the long term uh, versus buying a bottle of whiskey that is rare and uh, expensive right now, but might not be in demand when I want to sell it. I'm just also, when talking about a cask versus a bottle, just having a cask somewhere uh, in Scotland waiting for you and be able to go and visit a cask as well, which I hope as soon as the uh, this COVID restriction with st stops or lifts and we can travel and just to go visit your investment, I think that'll be also yeah. quite amazing going to see your cask somewhere. If you guys, if three of you guys wait until the end of August, we'll have our new site up in Speyside. So on the grounds of the McAllen, the Craig Ellicky, the Craig Ellicky Hotel, you guys could stay there. Um, awesome. we've got our, a new site just there for all of our clients' casks where they'll all be centralized into one unit. Um, and there is, I think I mentioned before to you, Gareth, perhaps there's a five-star tasting facility on site. So you guys can literally draw a sample from your cask with the warehouse man, oh, walk brilliant. about 50 yards, go through into the tasting zone, and you guys can sit and enjoy the cask, or we can, can sit and enjoy the cask, hopefully. Um, yeah. So that's going to be, if you guys can wait, if you can, you know, well, COVID might make sure you do, but uh, yeah, that's, that's going to be awesome. Yeah, well, we'll probably end up doing that. I think uh, holding thumbs, it might uh, have lifted by then, but it will probably Hopefully. not before that. So yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure by the time we see you, that will be the case. Hopefully. And um, Sam, what is the future as you see it for these guys' investment portfolio in whiskey? They want to hold for the longer term. As Gareth has said already, I know that Ruben and Ben have similar objectives. It's for later life going on to retirement. Uh, Gareth, quite recently, Gareth, I hope you don't mind me saying, bought mm. two beautiful casts of Craig Ellicke, which is actually the distillery where the new warehouse is going to sit. Um, so that's a longer term investment. Um, the Kalila is a bit older, going on eight now. Uh, they could perhaps sell that in the next four or five years. Um, I see a lot of growth with the likes of the Craig Ellicke, Kalila, Ben's also got a Highland Park now as well. These are top, top brands, um, you know, right to the, the top of the whiskey industry. Um, but hopefully, you know, if they are in the market in the next year, couple of years, uh, we can also boost their portfolio as well um, and add some awesome additions to, to their portfolio. So uh, growth, and hopefully some nice recasts to come as well in the future. Um, so Gareth and Ruben, how have you found the uh, the process of investing in whiskey? Would you recommend it? I would say the whiskey investment is a lot, a lot more subtle compared to other investments, especially now just seeing like everything in the red and then tomorrow everything's increasing again on the socks. Yeah. Just looking at the whiskey, it's a lot more stable and a lot more Almost calming, I would say. Yeah, one doesn't have to have sleepless nights about it. You know, the whiskey is just waiting somewhere, doing its own thing. 
No, no. The longer you wait, the better it gets. The better it gets. Well, that's the other investment at the moment. It's not uh, as easy as the whiskey. So Sam like, also made, made the actual process uh, of yes, purchasing the whiskey um, a whole lot easier than I would have imagined it to be. Um, you know, it's you agree today, by tomorrow the deal's going. Um, contracts are being drawn up. I think the process that they've got in place at, at I looked at this thing. I was like, "How do you even? How do you even buy a cask in your name?" And you know, they've got everything waxed. Yeah. Uh, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Gareth and Ruben, for joining and talking to us about your experience as Brave Own clients and a little bit about your lives outside whiskey. So thank you, thank you, and uh, take care of yourselves. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate an absolute it. pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. As every week on Liquid Gold TV, we have a musical performance and we have the phenomenal Kerry Watt this week, who's going to perform for us and have a little chat about her love of Scotland, whiskey and what she's up to with music. Kerry Watt is a singer and songwriter based up in Scotland, but has lived all over the world. UK, USA, has done some fantastic uh, gigs at Glastonbury, British Summertime, Hyde Park, Secret Garden Party, to name a few. And we are absolutely delighted to have her join us on Liquid Gold TV. Hello, Kerry. Hiya, how are you doing? Great, thanks. How are you? I'm good, thank you, yeah. I've seen that you describe your music as sort of like Americana kind of style. Yeah. What, what made you settle on that, on that kind of genre? Um, I think, well, when I picked up the acoustic guitar, um, <laughs> I just began by playing kind of jangly. You know, I couldn't do any finger picking stuff. I, I certainly couldn't shred or anything. So this jangly sound was really all I could play. <laughs> and that, but that really lent itself to the kind of music that I listened to. Sheryl Crow is my favorite artist ever. Like she's such an inspiration to me. And there's a lot of, um, music that I listened to when I lived out in the States, um, like the Eagles, and I discovered a lot of genres of music that I really wasn't um, aware of growing up in Glasgow, like blues and gospel and just kind of also that like American West Coast kind of feel, that old like 60s, 70s rock vibe as well. You appear to have been quite uh, busy online whilst uh, lockdown's been going and this whole stay at home thing yeah. has been um, in practice. So you've been doing these sessions. What are the positives of doing these sort of at home sessions versus doing live and the and the negatives? So do a little comparison of the two. If you look. Yeah, well, I write, there's, there's nothing like being on a stage and connecting with a big sea of people out there and try, I love the challenge of when I'm a supporting act trying to get this new audience on your side and win them over that's just amazing to me it's so much fun um, and especially in the summer when you're playing the outdoor stages that is just absolute magic I, I think that's my favorite thing in the world but making the most of the last three months doing a lot of these lockdown um, live streams and stuff. Um, you just connect with people in a different way so I can see in real time what people are saying to me. You know, people can request songs, people can ask me questions and that's really cool because that's, yeah, not something you can get on a, on a big stage. Have you, book I've asked you already before this chat, but for the sake of our viewers, have you been working on any new material in lockdown as well as working on the releasing of the album? Um, so because my album was already recorded before the lockdown, um, I've been spending most of my time writing for other artists um, and writing for sort of film and TV and that kind of thing. So this is something which is kind of new. Just in the last year, I've started writing for other artists and I've had a band and a couple of um, solo acts release songs that I've written either with them or for them so that's been really exciting. Do you, do you find that um, when you write songs for artists do you find that there's a, a varied amount of input that they then want with how you imagined it being performed because I imagine do, do you like sing a demo version and then? Yeah um, well it depends if the artist is in the room uh, or <laughs> on the Zoom call, and they're involved. I, I kind of will 
ask them loads of questions to try and dig deep and find out what is going on in their head and their heart that they might want to write about and just kind of try help them shape these ideas um, uh, so super flexible when you're collaborating with another artist but when you're writing something to pitch to someone else um, you kind of yeah you just have to do it how you imagine it and then let it go because once they've got it they're gonna make it their own and and that's important anyway absolutely this has been a fab chat with Kerry Watt uh, talking about her upcoming album Chasing Aeroplanes which will be available when Kerry? It's going to be next year but you'll be hearing an instalment of it over this summer. There will be an instalment of Chasing Aeroplanes <laughs> this summer and full release next year um, and I believe that we're going to have a little performance from you are we? Yeah I almost forgot about that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so I'll leave you to introduce the song, but I will just say, Kerry, thank you so much for chatting to us on Liquid Gold TV. This is Kerry Watt, and she is going to perform for us. Thanks. So I'm going to play um, a song that features in my upcoming album. I released it as a single a few months ago, and it's called Cut Me Loose. <laughs> To get me with a fine tooth comb Laid it on me heavy like I had no bones You hid me away like a babe in the wood Now I want a life that's all my own Standing on the wrong side of the rusty track Steady as a rocket out into the black I was on my way, I was long like the wolf Get me off this ride, I won't be back Don't look for me, everything appears simple I'll be running free, hiding out is so sinful Don't wanna see all the things that you're into Stay away from me, take that attitude with you Cut me loose and cut me loose and cut me loose and cut me, cut me, cut me loose. Rugged is the railroad I run along. Hollow are the memories that make me strong. I'll be far away. That's it for another week of Liquid Gold TV. Thank you so much for joining me. I'll see you next time for another dram.